Good morning again. 1919 in East Asia. It's actually quite a, um, I'm not sure if this was planned in advance, but if any of you have been reading the news today, it is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, which means that if you live in Beijing, your curtains are closed, uh, you've possibly been moved to an apartment further away from downtown, it's extremely smoggy, and if you're lucky, you're watching on television now uh, one of the greatest probably middle military parades in the history of, of humanity. Um, but I will take us to 2019 and to Tiananmen Square and the protests, not the protests, and the, uh, the, the parades which are ongoing right now uh, towards the end of this talk. But, um, but let me begin in the winter of 1919. In the winter of 1919, I think that people across East Asia had a reasonable cause to be optimistic. All of their countries, China, Japan, Korea, had to some extent participated in the Allied war effort. Japan had dispatched its, its navy, even as far as the Mediterranean. Chinese laborers had, had worked behind the lines on the Western Front. Koreans had toiled in factories. And we could expand this uh, comment to many other parts of Southeast or, or East Asia as well. Uh, their governments, or what, what existed of their governments, limited governments in some case, had made a good and astute gamble in 1914 on the side of France and Britain. Very few powers in East Asia had gone uh, in with the Germans. Uh, so in, in 1918, in the fall, in November, when the armistice, news of the armistice uh, reached East Asia, in all the capitals of this region, from Tokyo to Beijing to Shanghai to uh, Indo even in Indochina, there were large, large celebrations in the streets. Yet simultaneously, I think that below the surface, this optimism was already tempered with some pessimism. If you lived in, in East Asia, you were already beginning to feel the overwhelming, claustrophobic, disorienting ramifications of globalization and industrialization. Even if you only learned about the war through rumor, which is how many people might have, and through very distorted lenses, one was still shocked by the destruction of the war, the, the loss of life within Western Europe, and even if you lived within East Asia, you felt these effects perhaps quite directly. For example, in the winter, and spring or winter of uh, to, uh, 19, 1918 and 1919, the Spanish flu arrived in Japan, where 23 million people eventually suffered from the illness and approximately 390,000 died. So people were pretty conscious of the ways that railways, steamships, wire services, newspapers, clocks were propelling them into a future that separated them from their families, from their traditional lines of work, were regimenting them and perhaps alienating them from each other, from the government, from human feelings in a general sense. There was a sense of premon a premonition, nonetheless, that, that this year, 1919, was going to be important. Right? And by the end of 1919, this Wilsonian moment of optimism was definitely over. People had perhaps fundamentally misunderstood Wilson's comments about self-determination. As Erez Manella, another scholar, has pointed out, when Woodrow Wilson talked about self-determination, he was primarily talking about consent of the governed and speaking from a rather classic liberal Republican notion of what democracies or Republican government should look like. He wasn't really talking about national liberation, democracy on national, uh, uh, organized around national or nation units. So his primary concern and the concern of other Europeans was looking towards Eastern Europe, where they thought there were people who now deserve to be ruled by themselves. Moreover, people in East Asia, despite the optimism that they had about these vague promises of national self-determination, probably overestimated the ability of the United States to push through these measures in the face of very strong resistance from Britain and France, and they perhaps underestimated, as pretty much everyone did, Woodrow Wilson's physical survival over the course of this process. And uh, many, many places, from Japan to, to, to China, 
will be pretty disappointed in the outcome uh, of the Paris Treaty of uh, April of 1919. So today I'm gonna to go into a little bit more detail about the collapse of the Wilsonian moment in East Asia, um, talk about the kinds of social and political and economic changes which were unfolding in, in, in this region. And I'm gonna move nation by nation in a rather traditional way. But I think this still makes sense because for, for the elites, for the people writing and reading newspapers, generating headlines and producing art, in this period in 1919, their fundamental concern was nonetheless the nation, as politically incorrect as that might be today, as cosmopolitan as we might want to be at the present. People were really talking in national categories and believed that salvation could only come at, in a sort of national context. So I will nonetheless, I will move nation by nation. We'll walk across East Asia from Japan through Korea and then to China. But I will nonetheless throughout be trying to point out the transnational connections, the ways in which people and ideas are moving between these uh, various regions. Uh, one final introductory point, however. What really, I think, distinguishes East Asia in 1919 from other parts of the world, and perhaps this will belie my ignorance in other parts of the world, was that unlike, say, uh, the Middle East or South Asia, where you had revivalist, modernist movements who are taking traditions and trying to revitalize them uh, for the present, things like Muslim modernism. In China, Japan, and Korea, there was no equivalent to this. There was a fundamental rejection of tradition. Right? There was a belief that Confucianism in particular, that animating political and social construct that had been uh, an important part of the East Asian political uh, um, context since, well, since the six, especially the 1600s, uh, there was a sense that Confucianism in particular could not be revitalized. This was something which no one could salvage anymore. And even the other uh, religious and intellectual traditions were now labeled increasingly superstition. Right? There was a sense that they were fundamentally uh, unsuited to the modern world. The pathway to national salvation, to being a rich country with a strong army, fukoku kyohei, in, in the Japanese slogan, led through the train of European political thought, right? So the ideological and cultural battles of East Asia in 1919 will be metaphorically fought in Europe. That's why I'm not gonna begin this lecture with pictures of bamboo or peons to Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. These ideas were done, they were over. People's ideological concerns lay very much within the domain of Europe. So that will require a little bit of explanation over the next half hour. One could add, of course, that as these European ideas arrived in East Asia, they had to go through a process of translation. And in the process of translation, uh, ideas were adjusted, transformed, distorted in a certain sense. Uh, but nonetheless, the old ways could not be redeemed, and modernization meant westernization. There was really no daylight between the concept of modernity and its association with the West, France, Britain, and the United States. The wholesale adoption, though, of Westernization posed serious questions, disconcerting questions for people in East Asia. If we were gonna whole, you know, fully Westernize, what then was left? What did it mean to be Japanese? What did it mean to be Korean? What did it, what did it really mean to be Chinese if you had jettisoned your traditions, right? How would you maintain a sense of self-respect and dignity in the process of westernization? So these were the very, very deep, uh, dangerous, uh, and, and anxiety-inducing questions which people were trying to deal with in 1919. There was a sense that their own traditions were, were now worthless, were not gonna help them construct a new society, but there was deep anxiety about what kind of a society they might construct on the basis of Western culture and Western political institutions and Western political thought. So here's a brief image, map of East Asia around 1914. To point out here, we have 1914, you have uh, Korea now is a formally annexed into the new Japanese imperial state. You have a series of treaty ports along the Chinese coast, dominated by various Euro European powers, sometimes in concert, sometimes individually, 
where Europeans exercise extraterritoriality, where they can uh, take advantage of unique uh, custom laws that give advantage to European goods. Right? And in some parts of this, er this region, not only do they have treaty ports uh, under their own European sovereignty, but they also claim much broader swaths of influence, particularly in this region of Northeast Asia, now called Manchuria. The end of the lecture will end up in a slightly different map, one that looks like this. All right, so Japan. Across much of, East, much of East Asia, time had been marked for the previous 30 years by Japanese military victories. These were the, perhaps the big uh, watershed moments uh, in East Asia. The transformation of Japan uh, from a feudal state into an industrialized nation state and a great power between 1870 and 1900 shocked nobody more than it did the Japanese themselves. I have a couple images here just to give you a sense of this profound transformation. And this is, these are simply portraits of uh, the Japanese emperor himself. Uh, Japanese, the Meiji emperor during this period, reigned, not ruled, an oligarchy of, uh, of politicians worked behind the scenes to navigate the country through a series of uh, revolutionary reforms. But nonetheless, you get a good sense of the sort of image transformation of the emperor. Here's another good example of it. Right. A mirror of the Japanese nobility, uh, produced in 1887. Uh, some of you have seen this before in various lectures. It's just such a, pro a provocative image. Right? Elaborated with classical Japanese symbols, chrysanthemums, mountains, but nonetheless, this really bizarre and provocative and profound transformation even of costume and dress. Right? This whole pose is really fundamentally different than anything that would have been produced uh, 10 to 15 years earlier. Right? So Japanese, Japan's uh, transformation really uh, kind of began to get underway in the, in the 18th, well, uh, it was provoked by a series of uh, unfortunate events in the, in the 1850s. The United States and other European powers arrived at the shore of, uh, of Japan and demanded that it begin uh, opening its doors to, uh, to European commercial interests. This here is an image of one of the particular treaties uh, where the Dutch, uh, the Russians, the British, the French, and so on, uh, signed uh, one of the, uh, the un so-called unequal treaties. And Japan was not unique in this regard. Both China as well, a decade earlier, had uh, been forced to sign a humiliating and unequal treaties, the primary concerns of which were to give foreigners access to domestic Asian markets and um, and uh, uh, provide them with extraterritorial, extraterritorial, extraterritorial rights and, uh, and privileges. So in, over the course of about 10 or 15 years, the, the Japanese government at the time ultimately collapsed under pressures really generated by the social conditions of, uh, of the treaty, this new treaty port system which Japan was subject to. Um, it was, it was, in a way, forced to abide by international treaties, which, of course, caused massive dislocations and disruptions in Japanese society. So pressure grew from below for the government to take serious action against the foreigners. The government, however, did not have the power or the military forces to reject the foreigners. And so it was really caught in a trap between indigenous uh, growing uh, anti-foreign sentiments and the pressure from foreign powers to abide by these treaties. And every time some sort of small incident happened, a foreigner was executed or killed, or foreign goods were destroyed, this could become a, uh, 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 a rationale for further impositions of unequal treaties in Japan. The, govern, the government of the shogun fell in 18, 1868, and a small and surprising oligarchy emerged which introduced a very, very radical program of reform. They called it the Charter Oath. And I just want to uh, go through this just, just briefly because it's pretty provocative. In many respects, within this document, you can see the, uh, 
the ideas which led to the transformation of Japan uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. So a sense of bringing in a kind of some sort of limited repre representative government, deliberative assemblies. Number two, a sense of all classes high and low shall unite vigorously in carrying out the administration of affairs of state. This is a pretty radical statement in a society which had been highly stratified. In other words, the, the, the authors of the oath are saying that they want to create more of a, a national citizenry uh, who, are, who are all obligated to carry, uh, to carry the burden of governance uh, and civic life. Number three, the common people, no less than the civil and military officials, shall each be allowed to pursue their own calling so that there may be no discontent. So uh, lowering interference within the common lives of the people. The last two, though, I think are perhaps the most significant and distinguish Japan's approach to dealing with colonialism and imperialism from that of China. Number four, evil customs of the past shall be broken off and everything based on the just laws of nature. Right? For many of you, this should signal almost immediately a reference to uh, enlightenment or uh, European philosophy, right? the idea of natural law. Right? And this, you can see right here, that the Japanese, these Japanese politicians are very much situating their, their, their agenda within a trajectory of Hobbes and Locke uh, and Montesquieu and the, and the European uh, Enlightenment. Number five, knowledge shall be sought throughout the world so as to strengthen the foundation of imperial rule. Again, this new and aggressive search for information uh, in other parts of the world. One of the thinkers behind these proposals was a guy named Fukuzawa Yukichi the gentleman sitting down here, photographed in San Francisco in the early 1860s uh, with the daughter of the owner of the photography studio. Right? So Japan, in a, in, a, in a much earlier than China, began trying to figure out what was it that animated these European states? What was it about the United States, for instance, that had provided it with the kinds of material, weaponry, and technology to, to begin dominating East Asia? And pretty quickly, Fukuzawa Yukichi began to think about, uh, he, he began to believe that European superiority or American superiority had less to do with surface, superficial things like having ships and guns than something about its fundamental social systems. Right? In fact, he spent much of his time not talking about ships and guns or, or the development of navies as many of his contemporaries would be in, in China, for, for example, but really talking about relations between men and women basic education, uh, and other objectives, which he called sort of universal enlightenment. I think it's very significant that he, 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 he decided to pose in this way and then bring this type of photograph with him back to Japan. And really, he would try to always return the debate among Japanese uh, intellectuals and Japanese politicians to really basic social relations and his, and his belief that there was something about American and British uh, and continental European social mores uh, cultural beliefs, uh, social systems that had generated, that had provided the kinds of incentives uh, to dominate the world. And I, I think I should, it's useful to highlight just that it, 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 Japan's distinctive choices in this period become much more clear when you compare them to the choices of, of uh, Chinese reformers just across the East China Sea. In the 1870s, both states would attempt restorations rejuvenations of imperial rule. The Japanese rulers on the left, right? he was sort of picked out of country obscurity. Japanese emperors hadn't really ruled for, for centuries, really since the 11th century. He was kind of plucked out. And under the slogan of restoring the emperor and expelling the foreigners, this insurgent government was launched, uh, using him quite strategically as a figurehead. And they embarked on those, that sort of program of proposals, a program of proposals inspired by the Charter Oath and Fukuzawa Yukichi's teachings. On the right-hand side, we have the Tongzhi Emperor. Uh, unfortunately for him, still a child in this period. But the approach to reform was really much different. It was, could be characterized by the slogan, Chinese for essence, Western for use, the sense of limited appropriation of European technology and a preservation of our core social and political system. A sense that our values cannot be jettisoned. Our values uh, under, underlie, they're the foundation of our political system, and we really can't imagine changing this political system in any way, and that any radical political or social changes would actually be effective. 
one of the most influential thinkers of the 1860s in China would say, there's really nothing we need other than their guns and their ships. And so China began a program under the Tongzhi Restoration of education city style policies. Right? Bringing in limited groups of foreigners into limited spaces, usually around coastal China, usually on the outskirts of the treaty ports, to try to import in a limited fashion just Europe's technology and science. Right? So a very, very dramatic approach. A different approach. I like to often to show a, a photograph of, the, of one of these new arsenals, as they were called, outside of the city of Fuzhou, and point out the buildings as Georgetown, CMU, Carnegie Mellon, or Cornell. But the sense of sort of a limited appropriation, because we're really worried about uh, the impact this might have on our, on our value system, on our culture. In, ja in Japan, it's really remarkable. It's still it's difficult to explain why the reforms were actually in practice so revolutionary. And uh, by the 1890s, Japan was just so different, at least on the image level, right? So here we have the, the, the creation of a new constitutional monarchy with limited representation. So this is the promulgation of the constitution uh, painted in 1890. Here you have an illustration of the imperial diet of Japan. Even this word, this choice of word for this new uh, f uh, focal point of Japanese politics, the diet is of course a Latin word, dieta, coming from the, notion, the medieval uh, tradition of assemblies and legislatures in Central Europe, right? Hungary still has a diet. Uh, and, the, and the model here for this, even the choice of colors in a way, really reflects what they knew and what they aspired to on the basis of, of their new studies of the German social democratic or sort of German constitutional monarchy. They really ultimately, after thinking a lot about the United States, after traveling to France, after traveling to, to Great Britain, really decided that the Germans had got it right. That somehow the German state in the late 19th century had, had balanced uh, the concerns of monarchy and elites, which with some sort of system that uh, encompassed the, the, the population more broadly and had also uh, quite successfully mobilized people's resources for industrialization and war. Right? So the German model was extremely compelling. Right? Reforms in Japan were not just at the capital, but a thoroughgoing effort to rework the way that Japan was governed, to eliminate these feudal domains, the ways in which uh, Japanese society for the previous centuries had been cantoned off into feuds, into smaller domains by a variety of different lords uh, many of whom only related in an indirect way to the monarch or to the or to the uh, the capital itself, right? Many of these, some of these, so the yellow domains here are ones which were personally owned by the ruling elite. Some of these other domains were were ruled by the ruling elite's in-laws, but these other parts of the country, not identified with any particular color, really stood outside in some sense uh, the Japanese centralized government. Right? It was a vertical, it was a society full of vertical connections. Right? Segmented society with very little sense of us being Japanese, very little ability to mobilize resources nationally, uh, and certainly very few resources to, to uh, ways to organize industrialization. Right? On the right, the whole administrative fabric of society has been transformed. The central government now appoints technocratic bureaucrats to govern various parts of Japan. They've created a universal education system uh, for both men and women, although women uh, will not have the franchise until 1946, uh, until the Americans arrive uh, fully in Japan. And only a very small percentage of the Japanese population is actually allowed to vote in what is a fairly uh, vigorous uh, parliamentary system. So in 1919, for example, only about 5% of Japanese men are actually able to vote. Nonetheless, uh, by the end of the 18, 18, by the early 1890s, not only are people being educated in national system, not only have all these sort of local boundaries been uh, eliminated, people are paying national taxes, the state is channeling these resources into state-led industrialization, but there's also the blood tax, national conscription, the creation of a national army, right? And there's probably no better institution after education in which to create a sense of national identity. 
Right? We tend, again, I want to emphasize this, we tend to think of Japan as a very homogenous place. But this is really our 21st century perspective looking back. If you lived in Japan uh, before the Meiji Revolution, you would have a hard time identifying with people in different, different social spheres and from different types of places. On the ba basis of the principles of the Charter Oath and the importation of other ideas uh, uh, from the West, Japan was very successfully building a, a nation state that can mobilize human resources and persuade them to sacrifice on behalf of the nation. Right? This required the invention of new words, words which would become extremely influential across East Asia and would be the key words used in 1919. The first key idea was the notion of the nation uh, as a race. Right? The Japanese were trying to figure out a way to communicate that German or European notion of the Volk, the people, the nation. Right? And they took an old set of Chinese words, meaning people and clan, put these together and thought of the people of Japan as a clan, as a, as a, as a blood-linked consanguinous group. Right? In Japanese, they refer to this as minzoku. So they took old words from, from China and repurposed them to communicate new things. Similarly, they repurposed this term, the nation state, which literally before had simply meant this on the left is country, this on the right is family, what had previously meant the imperial family, the ruling family, that was of course the nation, that was of course the state, that was of course the sovereign, the, the locus of sovereign, uh, sovereignty in the, in the, in the non-modern period, and repurposed this term to think of the state as a family, right? The state as a family, as a unified uh, group, right? So you can see there's a lot of overlap between these two terms. Right? These are going to be the new ways in which uh, Japanese intellectuals articulate their ideals. And these words are so persuasive, these reformulations are so persuasive that for the next, right from the 1890s down to the present, Korean and, Japanese intellect, uh, Korean and Chinese intellectuals as well are going to appropriate these terms uh, to communicate their own ambitions. Right? In terms of foreign relations and Japan's broader relationships with the world, it's sort of a nice little piece of doggerel. In the West, there is England. In the North, Russia. My countrymen, be careful. Outwardly, they make treaties, but you cannot tell what is at the bottom of their hearts. There is a law of nations. It is true. But when the moment comes, remember, the strong eat up the weak. 80s Japanese song. Fukuzawa Yukichi himself, the sort of spokesperson for the Japanese Enlightenment, the appropriation of uh, liberal political traditions from, from Europe, would also write, what must, what must we do today? We do not have time to wait for the enlightenment of our neighbors so that we can work together toward the development of Asia. It is better for us to leave the ranks of Asian nations and cast our lot with civilized nations of the West. As for the way of dealing with China and Korea, no special treatment is necessary. Just because they happen to be our neighbors. We simply follow the manner of the Westerners in knowing how to treat them. Any person who cherishes a bad friend cannot escape his notoriety. We simply erase from our minds our bad friends in Asia. Of course, is a lesson they're learning from the American adventure in the Philippines. And I'm going to show you a series of, of images produced in one of in China's first in Japan's first successful uh, foreign engagement. This would be known as the 1890 in 1894 through 1895. Japan went to war with China over the question of Korea. And I think it's, there's a good analogy to make here between the causes of war. Uh, in East Asia and the causes of war in Europe, in both, in both places, it's really the gradual decay of a major imperial state and the, and the questions about the borderlands of this state and the territorial or sovereign claims of that state and the relations of, it, of its borderlands to the center, which really generated a lot of uh, potential violence. So much as the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the reworking of those Ottoman borderlands between the Austrian Habsburgs and uh, the Ottoman Empire and the French and the Russians was really this dangerous uh, 
um, storm of, of violence. Similarly, the collapse, the gradual collapse of the Qing state, uh, its inability to project its power uh, and the loosening hold its culture had on its neighbors really created uh, opportunities and incentives for Japan and other neighboring powers to sort of chew away at, at, its, at its peripheries. So the wars were really generated around the Chinese frontiers. And I think this is a very, uh, it's an effective image, but demonstrating quite clearly, uh, in a way, Japan's diff its different approach to modernity and, and dealing with the West than China. So here you have the Chinese Navy over here uh, being sunk by the Japanese Navy. And the Japanese in the, in the Sino-Japanese War of 1895 were much more capable of, of uh, consolidating their military forces. Both sides ultimately had very, very modernized ships. But China's ships were often captained by Europeans. Also, China's approach to supplying this war just could not match the industrial capacity of Japan. Japan's ability to move and concentrate men and material all across Northeast Asia could not be matched uh, by, the, by the Chinese. The motivation and spe fighting spirit of the Japanese troops was far superior to that of the Chinese. I think these types of images as well capture the way in which the Japanese thought about these, these, these military encounters. These are, in case you're curious, representatives of the Japanese admiralty accepting the defeat of the Chinese fleet from uh, Admiral Ding Ruchang. Here he is with his sort of foreign assistants, professors from Education City, hovering at their heels. The sense of the, the ultimate failure of this partial approach to modernity. Uh, this argument that Fukuzawa Yukichi was also made, making about the Chinese and Koreans as being sort of trapped in tradition, unable to break out, too en enchanted still with their own cultural uh, traditions, to realize, to see clearly what was going on around the world. Now, this is a highly problematic narrative, but this image, I think, captures it very, very, very well. Modern, Western, manly Japan facing off against the, the, the feminine China. Men still wearing dresses. Here again, you capture, these were the, this is an image of the treaty negotiations which resolved uh, the Sino-Japanese War of 1895, right? Just look at this image and think about who is standing? Who are the real men in the room, right? Who are the real people dispensing and ordering the power relations of East Asia in, 18, in 1895, right? These Americans who are working on behalf of the, of the Qing Empire, right, and the Japanese themselves. The sense that the, the Chinese couldn't even speak for themselves in an international forum. They just sort of look silly, right? This is a very purposeful construction, invention, or imagining of this, of this particular incident. In, the, in 1895, uh, China would be forced to secede significant territories to Japan in perpetuity. And, and Chinese defeat in this war also accelerated other European powers' attempts to take off and dismantle China in various ways. In 1904, the question of who would ultimately rule across the borders of Korea in Manchuria uh, finally came uh, into, into violent conflict. Uh, in 1904, just like in 1941, the Japanese would launch a surprise attack on the main uh, European military base in this region. I have a, a back to this, right? The Japanese Navy attacked Port Arthur, which was Imperial Russia's main bastion of military power in Northeast Asia. They arrived in the morning and sacked it with no warning. The war then spun for another two, uh, for another uh, over the next winter, uh, uh, resulting finally in the defeat of Japan in the spring of 1905 of this war. I, quite, I think this is quite a compelling image, the sense of Japan in a very self-conscious way, looking at itself and, and structuring its image according to its successes in this war. Japan is very, very astute in the early 20th century at creating a particular image which would be acceptable and appealing to the United States and Western Europe, right? Here they are participating in what would turn out to be one of uh, the International Red Cross's first uh, 
wartime efforts, right? So Japan hosted and, and um, supported the International Red Cross, looking like a very civilized European power in this sense. Right? Brilliant gunships. Of course, the success in these wars also allowed Japan to, to uh, establish new alliances with England and the United States, which ultimately marked the end of any kind of humiliating unequal treaties. So by the early 1900s, Japan was fully sovereign, unlike all of its, all of its neighbors. The Russo-Japanese War, I think, is also significant, though, in another sense. It was the first major industrialized uh, war. This was the first time that Euro European powers had faced another power that also had machine guns. Right? Unlike in Africa and India, here for the first time was a, was a nation that had the industrial capacity that could not necessarily rival Germany or France, but it turned out could rival the Russian Empire. Right? And you see people driven into forms of warfare which would become emblematic of the First World War. If only more people had visited Manchuria in 1904 and 1905, they would have learned the, the, the serious and devastating consequences of industrialized warfare. The Japanese learned it quickly and early. In one particular, come back to this, in one particular battle, the siege of Mukden, 150,000 uh, Russian and Japanese troops died in the course of several days. Right? These types of casualties would not be seen until the Somme right, in 19, 1915 and 1916. Of course, the Japanese couldn't entirely control their image. This is a picture from Le Petit Journal, a popular periodical produced in Paris. Uh, and the war was uh, certainly brutal. Nevertheless, at the end of uh, the Russo-Japanese War, uh, Theodore Roosevelt had won a Nobel Prize for having uh, officiated over the terms of the peace in my hometown of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, right? So the United States uh, intervened on behalf of both powers, but really favored the Japanese. And shortly thereafter, England as well in 1902 would sign its, one of its first ever mutual defense treaty with another nation, right? so with Japan. So the United States and, and Great Britain looking for a solid ally in East Asia who could preserve uh, their colonial uh, domains. Japan, as I said before, entered World War II uh, together with the Allies. Um, uh, this was quite opportun opportunistic and quite beneficial. Very quickly they occupied uh, the German territories here in Qingdao and elsewhere. Also significant, though, was the Japanese also sent their navy far out to the Pacific to take over uh, the former uh, German territories in the Solomon Islands, Marshall Islands, and other places, right? We tend to think of Japan as beginning its Pacific conquests only in the context of the 1940s, but this had already begun. Most of, many of Jap Japan's important uh, Pacific possessions had been acquired in 1914. Uh, the Japanese navy assisted uh, the Royal British Navy in patrolling the Mediterranean. Um, uh, um, and in 1915, the Japanese state issued the so-called 21 demands. The gentleman on the left is the, at, was at the time the president of China, a guy named Yuan Shikai. Uh, and these demands uh, can be organized into perhaps about five different categories confirming China's, uh, Japan's possession of these formerly German territories, uh, uh, a desire to extend their railway network from northeast China uh, into the south and get extraterritoriality and political rights uh, that, to, to support that railway. Uh, these 21 demands also demanded control over core uh, steel producing, uh, iron producing mines in central China. Uh, and would, would pro prohibit China from making any further agreements with any other Western power or nation. So this was pretty much uh, Japan's bid in the context of World War I to, to pretty much take over control of the Chinese coast and acquire core materials for ja continuing Japanese industrialization. Right? This was important to them as well, and they could sell this to a European public because Japan's industries were busy producing for the Western Front. Japan benefited in more, in more ways than one. It wasn't simply about territory. It was also about acquire, uh, uh, contributing 
and building up its own industrial sector by supporting the Allies. Silks, munitions, weaponry was produced in Japan and, read, and led to an important boom in the Japanese middle class. Wealth was spread throughout Japan in this period and led to important social transformations. Uh, the Europeans ultimately prevented Japan from getting its fifth demand, which was to insert Japanese advisors into every level of the Chinese government and military. But Japan walked away with its four general areas, uh, its four major requests. Of course, as you can imagine, this completely undermined the legitimacy of the Chinese president, right? And resulted in sorts of preliminary kinds of small street protests that would foreshadow the events of 1919, right? So in many ways, Japan won, but it lost the big picture, right? It absolutely poisoned the public perception of Japan within China, which had been at times actually surprisingly favorable, right? Many people in China were, were looking still to Japan as an ally, as a potential model, and Japanese people lived and were scattered throughout much of North China society. Uh, so it really undermined Japan's image within China and, of course, fatally undermined the government of Yuan Shikai. We'll come back to him in a moment. In 1917, the United States uh, came to a kind of a tacit agreement to each uh, uh, support each other's territories in East Asia. Right? Uh, in 1919, Japan, as one of the major victors or great powers of World War I, was able to sit at the table uh, in Paris. And, uh, and interestingly enough, one of its major concerns was a proposal to proclaim racism wrong. So it wanted a formal anti-colonial proclamation to be part of the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles that, was, that uh, uh, argued against racism. Uh, this failed. Uh, despite the support initially of the United States, Britain and France blocked this. It uh, was too, too worrisome uh, a, a clause to put into this treaty, especially when they thought about their territories in Africa and South Asia. And this was quite embittered the Japanese public. Right? Are we not a great power? Have we not uh, contributed to the war effort? Uh, you know, again, Japan won in many sense. It got a lot of territory at the end of World War I but it left a, a kind of bitter feeling in its mouth nonetheless, a sense that they were still somewhat second rate. Um, in 1921 and 22, they continued though to, to be uh, important members of the international community, signing arms reductions treaties uh, with the United States and mutual defense treaties in the early 1920s. So Japan at the end of World War, World War I in 1919 is kind of complicated, right? It's achieved quite a lot uh, in the First World War. Its industries are doing very, very well. Uh, but nonetheless, it still it emerges with a kind of a chip on its, its shoulder. Also, in the, in the immediate years right after, the world, in, starting in 1919, all of a sudden, European demand for Japanese stuff dramatically declines. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are thrown out of the factories of Japan in 1919, leading to pretty serious social disruption, right? There's growing pressure for expanding the franchise, for allowing women to vote, for trying to tweak the, what's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, trying to tweak the Japanese political system to make it more representative, uh, but much of this ultimately is not very successful. By the end of the 1920s, I think there's sort of two outcomes of 1919. Two sort of competing, maybe contradictory outcomes. The first is a sort of a political and social system which looks democratic but is very, very fragile. You have a vigorous sort of parliamentary politics, but then you have a lot of extra constitutional sources of power. You have a military, which is not really controlled by the parliament and these parliamentary and these cabinets. You also have a group, a thing called the Privy Council, a group of nobles, a group of sort of uh, legacy oligarchs who are also really not responsible in, to people in any particular way. And it's this sort of extra territory, ex, extra ad hoc centered, extra constitutional ad hoc sources of power, which ultimately will undermine uh, the Japanese uh, democracy, sort of proto-democracy, and pave the way for a military uh, dictatorship in the 1930s. The ideas which animated that move towards dictatorship in the 19, uh, in 1930s also emerged here on the left from that feeling of unease with the progress of modernity. Japan had done it all. It had crossed its T's and dotted its I's. 
it had become a modern Western state. But that question of what it meant to be Japanese hadn't been answered. The feelings of alienation had perhaps only been deepened. You had a society which was ha highly fractured, very uneven, very unequal. And there was beginning, especially within the military, that group of society which was very, very hard to supervise, a new notion that a new Japan could be, could be created in the fertile and untapped territory of China, particularly Northwest China. The sense that we could cure the ills of modernity by starting afresh in Northeast China. This idea grew within the military, within people who had been demobilized without jobs, people who had been cast out of factories, and these ideas really took off in the 1930s, especially in the context of global depression. And I'm gonna end this discussion of, of Japan with this, with this image, which I think is particularly evocative of this moment. So this is a child's kimono. I have a detail of it on the right. Produced around 1920, around 19, 1919, uh, that shows Japanese and Chinese children marching together through the fertile territory of North, Northeast Asia, working together to exploit uh, sort of virgin lands, if you will. It's frightening, actually. Right? Really sort of children's costumes and clothing really making a very, very compelling argument for Japanese imperialism and deepening Japan's relationship with other parts of East Asia. Um, I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly through Korea. In some respects, the Korean situation is rather simple. I don't wanna oversimplify, but Korea in 1919 uh, is, has been formally annexed uh, into Japan already for nine years. In 1905, uh, the Japanese, after their victory against the Russians, formally took over J Korea as a protectorate. Whatever sort of indigenous movements for independence had begun were stifled. This is a, the independence arch which had, which had been built by uh, local uh, Korean intellectuals and nationalist politicians uh, in the late 19th century. This whole infrastructure and ideology of Korean independence was uh, purpose, purposely eradicated uh, during the war years. Korean students studying in Japan, however, became a bastion of Korean nationalism. Right? The closer you get to the center of the power, sometimes the easier it is to say things. Right? Many respects, living in Beijing, you have a lot more uh, political flexibility than you do out in the provinces. Similarly, Korean students in Tokyo were able to begin mobilizing around Korean nationalism during the course of World War II, and World War I, and especially after uh, Wilson proclaimed uh, national self-determination for all peoples. Uh, having heard news uh, of uh, what was going to most likely be a very unfavorable treaty to Korea, um, students in, in Tokyo and then sending messages back to uh, Korea began organizing a massive large-scale protest uh, in, uh, for, scheduled for March, March 1st. What I'm gonna walk you through here is an interesting, an envelope that was a letter, a document which was sent uh, first from Korea to Shanghai and then Shanghai to New York. It's a pamphlet about the March 1st Korean independence movement. So here it is, our first page, Korea's Cry for Freedom. This was penned by uh, foreign missionaries working closely with Korean Christians because really one of the major groups animating Korea's nationalist movement in, in uh, 1919 were Korean Christian associations and churches. So it was very much a transnational and national movement at the same time. You'll notice it's careful situating of Japan uh, against the backdrop of Russian, uh, sorry, Russian, um, German atrocities in World War I. Right? This, these claims about objectivity, Japanese Prussianism, and peaceful Koreans. One of the most uh, important aspects of the March 1st movement in Korea was a very explicit call for nonviolent protests. Here are some of the protests breaking out. 
was a fairly large scale event, uh, the core of which were university and other students, youth, uh, and then other uh, people from the urban population of, of Seoul. Uh, there was significant violence, which unfolded afterwards. The Japanese claimed that about 500, maybe, uh, sorry, uh, Korean nationalists would claim that about 7,000 people were killed, uh, 15,000 injured, and there were perhaps around 45,000 arrests that really shocked, um, this really shocked the Japanese state. They really weren't particularly prepared or ready for this, this incident. Um, one of the most uh, moving sort of statements to come out of this was a young Korean woman, Yu Kwan Sun, who uh, from prison where she would eventually die, wrote the following. Even if my fingernails are torn out, my nose and ears are ripped apart, and my legs and arms are crushed, this physical pain does not compare to the pain of losing my nation. My only remorse is not being able to do more than dedicating my life to my country. Very idealistic. Um, and the March 1st protests would very much set the tone for uh, similar protests elsewhere in East Asia. One other comment, though, before moving to China. After the failure, or the proximate failure, if you will, of the March 1st movement, uh, Japanese, uh, Korean nationalists uh, began organizing a government in exile in Shanghai, down here. Um, so that was a very uh, important outcome of the March 1st movement was the, was the establishment of a provisional Korean government. But unfortunately, from the very, very beginning, this Korean government was fractured by two competing ideologies, a group that was increasingly uh, oriented towards socialism and Marxism, uh, and a group that had uh, different objectives, um, who, who saw as their model more the United States uh, and, and Western Europe. So already in this March 1st movement, we see the contentious intellectual and political debates that would ultimately lead to the division of Korea in the 1950s. So, again, so the basic argument here is we need to think about 1919 as, the, as one of the important starting points for the division of Korea. This wasn't just something imposed uh, by the victors of World War II in 1945. Finally, turning to China, a place I'm perhaps more familiar with. Um, China in 1919 was a revolutionary society. We tend to think of, when people think in an abstract way about the 20th century history of China of 1949, the big communist revolution as being the revolution. But if you lived in 1919, the big revolution that people talked about was the revolution, the national revolution of 1911 and 1912, which had brought down the great Qing state. Here it is, the Great Qing Empire at its greatest extent, and perhaps quite legitimately, I could include places like Korea, the Korean Peninsula as well. This is the way in which Chinese nationalists or the, or the, the new Republic of China in 1912 imagined itself. Unfortunately, almost immediately, many of these territories would declare their own succession uh, from the Republic of China. And until the 1950s, Tibet, uh, would be independent, and Mongolia as well would become permanently independent under, under Russian and then Soviet uh, support. Looking back on the revolution of 1911, one of uh, the revolutionaries or thinkers who was most strongly influenced this, this national revolution wrote, the 1911 revolution was like when you open a bottle of cold beer. The foam quickly bubbles up to the surface and appears awfully busy. But when the moment is over and the foam dissipates, it is still a cold bottle of beer. So 10 years on, or, or at this point, seven or eight years on for the National Revolution of 1911 and 12, uh, the promise of this moment seemed to have completely dissipated. Right? People were extremely dis disappointed in the results of China's National Revolution. Sun Yat-sen, again, one of the people very much involved in this national revolution, was in exile. Right? He wasn't even in China anymore. And the revolution had quickly been co-opted uh, by a military commander from northern China by the name of Yuan Shikai. Uh, 
a man who had been the commander of the Qing state's most effective and modernized military forces, who then went over to the rebels in 1911 on the promise of being given the title of president. Under his watch, China actually did have, in 1912, uh, its first democratic elections. They were the last democratic elections ever to happen uh, within uh, the territory of modern China. Uh, on their way to the new parliament, uh, many of the important members of the opposition were assassinated. And really, by 1915, this uh, parliamentary republic existed in name only. Uh, in the aftermath of, well, here he is being sworn in as president. Here he is uh, with some of his uh, foreign advisors. And here we get to sort of have a little bit of fun because one of Yuan Shikai's most important advisors was the American political science scientist, Frank Goodnow, a illustrious Harvard professor who also happened to be the president of the American political, so political science association at this point in time. He dispatched himself to China uh, with some invitations from uh, the government of Yuan Shikai, and was one of the people that advised him to pro reproclaim a monarchy at the end of 1915. This went very, very badly. Do not take the advice of American political scientists. You know, Frank Goodenow really thought, you know, democracy and republic is not, clearly the last three years have been a good example of why China is not suited yet for democracy or republicanism. Uh, it's probably still a kind of people that really deserve a monarch. So let's transform good old Mr. Yuan Shikai back into a monarch. Of course, this ran right up against the fact that Yuan Shikai was dealing with these atrocious demands from Japan. His legitimacy was fundamentally undermined. And actually, this idea of Republican government was remarkably strong. The end result, however, was the eventual sort of disbandment of the national parliament and the fracturing of China into a group of uh, new domains uh, commanded by, quote unquote, patriotic militarists, warlords of various sorts. And really for the, the decade between 1916 and 1926, uh, this was the, decades of, the decade of guns, the decades where warlords ruled. Uh, by 1919, and this will really shock you, China had more men under arms than any other country in the world. Right? This despite the fact that Europeans have just fought a massive global war. There are more men in China serving in military forces than any place else, both in a relative sense and, of course, in just a gross a number sense. Right? China accounted for, in 1915, 15 percent of all global arms sales. It was the dumping ground of the excess capacity of every armaments industry on Earth in the early 1920s. It was absolutely the largest arms market that you could imagine. Here is one of our patriotic militarists, a guy named Zhang Zongchang, and he's really emblematic of the kinds of characteristics of these warlords. There was a kind of ostentatious craziness to these people. And this was, uh, they had often come out of actually Japanese military schools. Um, they had served in the model armies of the late Qing state. They had bases of military power and family networks, and they used these to build up their own satrapies all across China. Zhang Zongchang was known as the dog meat general. He was also famous for the three don't knows. He didn't know how many wives he had. He didn't know how much money he had, which is probably not enough. And he didn't know how many soldiers he commanded. He had 26 concubines of many different countries. Um, and he was famous for his ability to chop open melons. Right, anyways, this gives you the sense. But if there is any one single photograph that can capture the atmosphere of China in 1919, it's this. Our forlorn con peasant conscript off to fight for some cause that cannot be clearly articulated uh, and uh, will most likely result in his death. Looking at this scene in 1917, let's sort of skip. You know, and this is one of the other places a lot of Chinese are going to go. So a brief comment here on the Chinese workers who were sent to the Western Front, many of whom died there. Here's 1919 in China. 
printing presses. We'll come back to that in a moment. Lu Xun. Let's talk about Lu Xun. Go on to become China's perhaps most prominent modern 20th century writer, person that would capture the zeitgeist of this, of this 1919 moment. Um, when looking at the situation of China, uh, he was utterly uh, um, in despair. And he was invited to begin, he was invited to write uh, for a new journal about which I'll talk, a new magazine for youth. Uh, and he said at first, no. And he, and he later on recalled that he'd, he'd explained this, the following anecdote to the person who'd act, asked him. Um, where am I? He says, suppose there is an iron house without a single window or door and visually indestructible. Inside are many inhabitants sleeping soundly, all about to suffocate to death. Now if you're, this is on fire, this iron house. He looks at China and sees China as an iron house which is on fire with people inside who cannot possibly get out. He says, if you were to call out, awakening those few who are dozing lightly, leading these unfortunate few to suffer the agony of facing a sure death, do you think you would be doing them any good? In other words, Lucian was saying, why bother making culture? Why bother writing? Why bother attempting to rescue this nation when it's basically trapped in an iron box? It's, this is, the situation is so terrible. We are doubly enveloped by different forms of, of, uh, of colonialism. We have the Japanese, we have the Europeans, we have our own government, which doesn't really stand up for us and is, and is fractured into a whole bunch of competing warlords. Why bother? Ultimately, though, he is persuaded, as are many of his other, his generation of people, many of them educated in Japan or at universities like this one in Beijing, They're invited to begin contributing to this new journal. Uh, and this is, the, this is one of the most important things that's going to be coming out and coming to fruition in 1919. Uh, it's the thing we're going to call the new culture movement. This belief that in order to save China, we fundamentally need to change the culture of China. And there's this belief that if we change the culture, we've changed the, the habits of thought, we can actually... Uh, facilitate a physical transformation of the Chinese people. This is not just simply about transforming their ideas. It's this belief that we transform their ideas and we transform their bodies. We, re we re reinvigorate the Chinese people. One of the people behind this new journal wrote, we fully agree with the French positivist philosopher Auguste Comte, who said, if you want to reform politics, you must first change habits of mind. His words are particularly apt for the sorry situation of contemporary Chinese politics and society, which is caused by an obstinate mentality. Chinese mentality today has three characteristics. It's slavish, autocratic, and chaotic. Our thought revolution aims to change slavish mentality into independent thinking, to change autocratic mentality into egalitarian thinking, and to change chaotic mentality into logical thinking. In the first edition of this journal, the editor would call for people to be independent, not servile, progressive, not conservative, aggressive, not retiring, cosmopolitan, not isolationist, utilitarian, not formalistic, scientific, not imaginative. At first, the two slogans animating what would become the, the May 4th movement of 1919, the protest against European colonialism, would be animated and organized around the words of democracy and science. In many respects, it's at this moment in 1915 when a small group of Chinese intellectuals are really taking up a torch they felt was passed to them by the Japanese. The sense that in order to rescue their civilization, they had to jettison their traditions uh, and begin a process of fundamentally remaking China, starting with thoughts and culture, and then building out to there to its political institutions. Um, this new culture movement, this attempt to create uh, new modes of thought, a new language for the Chinese people, new cultural forms like novels and new forms of artwork, collided in 1919 with the great uh, anger about uh, China's, uh, the mistreatment of China uh, in the Paris uh, treaties. Um, within a couple of days of news that China's territory, former, the German territories had been given to Japan. Uh, students at Beijing University and other Beijing-based universities began to mobilize, and on May 4th, uh, 
uh, they preemptively marched into the streets around Tiananmen Square. They had scheduled their protests for the 7th, but very astutely moved them forward a couple of days when they learned that they were about to be arrested. Uh, chanting slogans, uh, um, they arrived at the, at the uh, gates of the foreign embassies, and their manifesto was as follows. The loss of Shandong means the destruction of China's territorial integrity. Once territorial integrity is destroyed, China will soon be annihilated. Today, today we swear two solemn oaths with all our countrymen. One, China's territory may be conquered, but it cannot be given away. Two, the Chinese people may be massacred, but they will not surrender. When they couldn't uh, get at the foreign legations, they decided to sack the house of China's foreign minister, who had just sort of given, in a sense, given away China and its formerly German territories, uh, where they roughed up his concubine and beat up another Japanese official who happened to be uh, there. And they were uh, arrested for these uh, activities. But really, in, a, in some sense, the events of that day were not as significant as the fact that this, this group of people quickly mobilized themselves into a national, uh, a movement of national scope and scale. And so this is where I begin to move to the conclusions of, of today's talk. Right? They began to really take those new cultural forms and ideas about learning and changing people's habits and began moving out quite aggressively into, into different parts of society. Uh, they mobilized uh, boycotts, um, and all kinds of other sorts of I incidents, and very much inspired by the events in Korea just a couple of months earlier. Um, their attitudes began to reflect growing dismay, of course, with the claims of the West, right? Uh, really, the promises and then the denial of those promises in Paris really did magical work to destroy uh, the persuasiveness of the American and, or Anglo-Saxon sort of liberal model, right? It was really um, undermined by, that, by the actions in, at the Paris Peace Accords. You can imagine this led to a further deepening of the rejection of traditional Chinese culture, expansion of their attempts to create new culture, and a reassertion of the centrality of intellectuals, not warlords, uh, to China's political spaces. And this is a pretty radical moment. It's saying that women have a right to be in public, it's saying that young people have a right to be in public, and it's saying that not only do these people have a right to be there, but they're, they're pure, they're less uh, polluted, they're less stained than other aspects of society, and therefore have a particular political burden to bear. Right? That's really flipping uh, China's traditional uh, uh, respect for, for elders. So it's really a, a generational revolution in many ways. It looked all around the world for new ideas, including to South Asia, um, creating new art forms, often based on European forms. The, the scream of China, you know, death of Lu Xun. Finally, this led to the search for alternate paths to modernity. They were, of course, going to be European, but they weren't necessarily French, British, or American. And so, the, perhaps the most important and uh, influential outcome of 1919 was a turn to the Soviet Union. And the surprising promise which Bolshevism might hold for non-Western societies. Marxism was appealing because somehow it had succeeded in another backwards society like Russia. It was also very appealing because it was scientific, or so it claimed to be. It was also appealing because the Bolsheviks were explicitly anti-colonial. When they said self-determination, they meant national determination, not just some garbage rhetoric about self, uh, about you know, republicanism. Right? They really meant it. And, and Russia uh, withdrew its claims to Chinese territories in 1921. The other important thing which Russia or the Bolsheviks would do would provide a particular unique political toolbox so that Chinese revolutionaries actually realize their goals. The, the Leninist party, with its discipline, with its military capacity, was an important tool that was now added to China's warlord environment. In many respects, both parties, the Nationalist Party and the Chinese Communist Party, were both created by the Soviet Union, were both organized around Leninist 
structures, and both had their own uh, autonomous military forces. In 1927, a second national revolution would be accomplished when this alliance of communists and nationalists marched north and finally reunified the country. Last minute here, I'll say, it was this reunification of the country in 1937 between the communists and uh, the nationalists, this new united front, which scared the bejesus out of the Japanese. And it was the threat of a unified, reunified China that ultimately pushed the Japanese into the dramatic attack on China in 1937. So there you get uh, World War. World War II starting. All right, I think I've exhausted every possible aspect of 1919 uh, and all of your patience and the entire amount of time I had. This is what happens when I have a lot of coffee and way too many slides in the morning. But uh, there you go. I think it's important to point out here, both Mao and, and uh, Jiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, nationalist and communist leaders, were both products of this 1919 uh, new culture, May 4th movement. They're sort of two sides of a coin, but ultimately bitter, bitter enemies. I think they're very emblematic of many of the intellectuals and artists and politicians that emerged out of 1919. They were intimately, intimate enemies. They knew each other well. They'd all been together at the protests in 1919, but 30 years later were prepared to kill each other. So, happy anniversary, China.